Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 8 and 9 deals with the seven trumpets. Now, I'm not on the seven trumpets yet. I'm going to read you something interesting. And I know where I left off in the horsemen. And I'll get back to it. And what I'm about, read, about ready to read to you, I necessarily don't agree with everything about it. But one of the things that you'll see and hear is how quickly, it didn't take very long, a few hundred years ago, the thought process concerning this book of Revelation changed. Now I covered that way back in the beginning of the teaching. And most of Revelation is put in a futurist type look type view. And supposedly that brings us understanding, which it doesn't. It's what I call Christian science fiction. If you're gonna classify me in any kind of category, I guess I would be more of a historicist than a futurist. Well, I believe there's certain things that do happen in the future that we haven't really even looked at yet. Well, we have looked at some. Certain things, some things haven't happened yet. For an example, the complete destruction of Damascus. I was telling someone earlier today, you look at the Huta province, which is just a very large suburb of Damascus. It's right next to it on a map. It's being devastated. It's being destroyed. People are dying in large numbers. I believe that in the Psalm 83 war, a war between Israel and Syria will take place in other nations surrounding Israel and the final de de devastation will come where Damascus will no longer even be a city habitable for anyone so I do have if you're gonna put me in any kind of category you have to put me in a little bit of all of it but probably lean more toward a historicist than anything else. But, and as I'll read to you in a few moments, it's not always been that way, where everybody looks at it, 99% of it in a futuristic view of what still has to happen in the seven year period. Tonight's subject matter, even though I'm not really teaching on this chapter tonight, I'm just reading it for reference when I read this piece, which I'll read to you in a few moments, you'll have a better understanding where I'm reading from and what am I referring to. Verse 1, the fifth angel sounded and saw a star fall from heaven upon the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. We've covered somewhat of this before, literally just a hole in the ground. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. <clears throat> and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and, t and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass, the earth, neither any green thing, neither anything, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, do you believe this is actual locusts? That insect, ugly looking, noisy insect? No. No. And to them was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months, and the torment was the torment of the scorpion which he strike at a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. 
and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had their hair as the hair of woman, and their teeth were, were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of the wings was the sound of chariots, of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto the scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their powers was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is the Hebrew, in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollon, or literally a destroyer. <coughs> One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Now, I'm going to get into more details later on in the series, but just so you know, where this piece is coming from in the book of Revelation so you have a better understanding what I'm reading and what it's referencing. Protestant scholars of the past were not futurists in their interpretation of prophecy. Instead they were historicists. Unlike modern interpreters who, mo who apply most of Revelation to a short period after the rapture, these ancient heroes of faith apply the trumpets in Revelation 8 and 9 to actual events in the history of Christianity. Protestant forerunners applied the fifth and the sixth trumpets to the rise of Islam. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, it has to do something with Islam, but just not the fifth and sixth. The other trumpets that lead up to it too, but that's a teaching for later on in the series. Protestant forerunners apply the fifth and the sixth trumpets to the rise of Islam in Arabia. In Revelation chapter 9, John saw an army of locusts come out of the smoke that issued out of the bottomless pit. This army of locusts had power, but their power was limited. They were not to hurt the grass or trees. They were allowed to harm only those men who did not have the seal of God in their foreheads. They had the power to torment like a scorpion. They were allowed to hurt men for five months. John described their appearance with these words, and the shape of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of woman, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, and it was as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses ready to battle. And they had tails like of the scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Let's look at describing visions and interpreting prophecy. The book of Revelation is called the prophecy, Revelation 1 verse 3. Sometimes prophecy is something that the prophet just intuitively senses as a result of a spiritual sensitivity and receptivity. Other times prophecy is given in the form of a vision, something the prophet sees. When prophecy takes the form of a vision, as it did for John, it is often not intended to be understood in a literal, simplistic way. God showed the prophets visions and they recorded what they saw, perhaps without even fully understanding exactly what their visions meant. <coughs> Some visions were difficult to, to describe. The prophets sometimes lacked the voc vocabulary to tell exactly what it was they saw. This is why the prophets description of their visions are sprinkled with words such as like, as, as if, as it were, like unto, the likeness of, the appearance of, etc. How often such words appear in John's description of the army of locusts or in Ezekiel's description of the cherubim? Prophets were forced to use this language of ambiguity and impression a rever uh, and a reverence of vagueness. Okay, because earthly languages cannot fully describe heavenly visions. In other words, they try to best describe what they saw 
by what they knew. Imagine someone trying to describe something differently. Imagine trying someone describing something they saw in a vision or prophecy two, three thousand years ago that has details of today's modern world and what it might look like. The picture paints a thousand words, but I don't think they can even find the words to describe what they were seeing, if that was the case. The best the prophets can do is, with earthly languages is describe their heavenly visions by comparing them to earthly things with which their readers or listeners are familiar with. So the, this army of locusts, what are they? So what was John talking about when he described the army of locusts? Was it a fleet of 21st century military helicopters? That's what some teach. Some modern day teachers who promote trendy pop interpretations of prophecy see nothing more than helicopters in these verses. Do I think they're helicopters? No, I don't. Christians of the past who know history better than most of us do saw this army of locusts as prophecy of the rise and spread of Islam. Writer Robert Whelan states that the reformers clearly recognize Islam. Now everyone's heard of this next person. In this passage, John Fox, author of Fox's Book of Martyrs, said that it's clearer than light itself that this is a prophecy of the Muslim conquest. Quote, well into the 19th century, a chorus of Protestant prophetic scholars identified Islam's niche in prophecy as being this, these fifth and sixth trumpets. End of quote. Whelan says, commentator Albert Barnes wrote, quote, with surprising Surprising, commentators have agreed in regarding this to the, empire, to the empire of the Saracens or to the rise and the progress of the religion and the empire set up by Muhammad. End of quote. Many of the older commentators agree. W.B. Godby began his comments on Revelation 9 by stating, quote, this chapter is a thrilling description of the rise and progress of the Mohedian Wars. Adam Clark, famous commentary, said that John's description of the army of locusts certainly agrees better with the Saracens than with any other people of na or nation and agrees very well with the troops of Muhammad. End of quote. Here's another famous commentary person. Matthew Henry referred to the army of locusts as the armies of the Mohedian Empire. Everyone's heard of the next person. John Wesley said, All this agrees with the slaughter which the Saracens made for a long time after Mahomet's or Muhammad's death. End of quote. So what happened? Why did we drift away to this futurist look on a seven year history of period of time where things are just going to happen in light speed amount of time. Most of the things you read in the book of Revelation are shortly after the rapture. If you're a pre rapture, pre tribulation, rapture person. Now, do I think the great tribulation is set for a short period of time before? The Lord's final return? No, I don't. You know where I stand on that. If you don't, read the last day series. This is all made up Christian science fiction. And great commentators, great for their time, and what they were putting out, knew there's something with this Islamic belief system that found its way especially in this 7th century 
up to the point where these people lived that made sense to them that if you look at it from a historious point of view it lines up perfectly what we find in the book of Revelation in their, this case we're just dealing with Revelation chapter 8 and chapter 9 now I'll read things and I necessarily won't agree with all of it because I'm going to go back and teach in these chapters but it gives you an idea where they were leaning where they were leaning in their interpretation of these chapters and then if you know the history of how I started this series many many years ago the players both male and female how they came in and they start dominating the field of prophecy and we drift into major Christian science fiction nonsense from that point on the army of locusts came forth from a dark cloud of smoke that rolled out of the bottomless pit the bottomless, bottomless pit in the Greek is abusos the source of our English word abyss some English Bible simply translated as the abyss it is remarkable that Abu Allah Maududi, one of Islam's most prominent scholars of the 20th century, used the very word abyss when writing about the beginnings of Islam. In a book written to introduce English speaking people to the basis of Islam, Maududi tells his reader that Muhammad and his message came out of Arabia. The abyss of darkness that's his words these are his exact words and they appear in bold print as a subheading in his book it is no mere coincidence that this outstanding Islamic author unwillingly identified Islam's source in bold print no less as the abyss of darkness using the very same word that appears in Revelation we find locusts in Arab literature why an army of locusts to represent an army of Arabs about 900 years before John's revelation the prophet Joel has symbolically described an invading attacking army as a swarm of locusts any large evading army might be compared to a swarm of locusts but the Arabs Muhammad have a unique connection to the locusts quote in the Bedouin romance Antar A -N -T -A -R, the locust is introduced as a national emblem of the Ishmaelites one of the ancestors of the Arabs and it's a remarkable coincidence that Muslim tradition speaks of locusts having dropped into the hands of Muhammad bearing on their wings this inscription and it reads we are the army of the great God or Allah coincidence as we saw a Muslim writer unwillingly connect Islam's beginnings to the abyss here we see Muslim writers unwittingly connect Islam to the locusts that come from the abyss. And how did that happen? And when did that happen? And how does it connect to the four horsemen? Or does it? We'll see. The army of locusts had certain restrictions placed upon them, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth neither any green thing neither any tree but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehands Revelation chapter 9 verse 4 once again Islam connects itself to these prophecies by the words of its own literature concerning trees and vegetation listen close folks because this is straight from the Quran now the Quran says Quote, when you fight the battles of the Lord, destroy no palm trees nor burn, burn any fields of grain. Cut down 
no fruit trees. Bible says they were not to harm or hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. In the Quran, it says, when you fight the battles of the Lord, destroy no palm trees, nor burn any fields of grain, cut down no fruit trees. Albert Barnes wrote, this precept is the most remarkable because it has been the, it has been the usual custom in war, and particularly among barbarians and semi-barbarians, to destroy grain and fruit, and especially to cut down fruit trees, in order to do the greater injury to the enemy. Those with the seal of God were not to be killed, according to Revelation 9.4. Muslims' armies were instructed by Caliph, one we already covered, the second horseman, Abu Bakr, Muhammad's successor, to not kill humble, pious Christians who lived in monasteries. Concerning, and not just monasteries, by the way. Concerning such Christians, the Muslim armies were told to let them alone and neither kill them, nor destroy their monasteries. It is a well-known fact that Muslims had deep respect for St. Francis of Assisi. They likewise had respect for humble, sincere Christians in early centuries. Apparently, apparently these were the Christians who, at least in the minds of Muslims, had a seal of God to protect them. Coincidence? Well, one coincidence after another, if it is. The locusts in John's vision were not allowed to kill them, but they were to torment them like the scorpions for a period of five months. Commentator Barnes understood this to, this to, to man that Islam was not to cut off and destroy the church, but was to bring up upon its various calamities to continue for a definite period. Five months. <coughs> five months is understood by most commentators to mean five prophetic months. That is 150 years. The figure is based on the one day equals one year principle suggested in Numbers 14, 34. Ezekiel 4, 6 and Daniel 9, 24 also. Muslims did indeed vex and afflict the Christian world for five prophetic months. After a century and a half of war and conquest, an important change came over the followers of the prophet of Mecca, turning them from the love of con conquest and pursuits of literature and science. Barnes says, from that period they ceased to be, form to be formable to the church. Their limits were gradually contracted. Their power was diminished and the Christian world in regard to them was substantially at peace. <coughs> John's description of the locusts appears, appearance sounds very much like history's description of the Muslim armies of Muhammad's day. The first thing John notes is that the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. The locusts were not just horses, but something more, like unto horses. Adam Clark wrote, the Arabs are the most expert horsemen in the world. They live so much on the horseback that the horse and their rider seem to make but one animal. This would account for John's description of the horse and rider as if they were one single being rather than two separate beings. John describes the locusts as wearing, as it were, crowns like gold. Not actual, not actual crowns, but as it were, crowns like gold. In the Arab story Antar cited earlier, it is written that God or Allah intended for Arabs that their turbans should be unto them instead of diadems or diadems. Gabi points out that yellow turbans were worn by Muslims. John Locusts had faces of men and their hair of women. Historical references from the 3rd, 4th, 5th centuries mention that Arabs wore beards. That would be the faces of men and long uncut hair as the hair of woman. Quoting again from the Arab poem Antar, we see a reference to beards, shoulder length hair, and turbans on Arab men. He adjusted himself properly, twisted his, quote, he adjusted himself properly, twisted his whiskers, and folded up his hair onto his turban, drawing it from off his shoulders, end the quote. 
The teeth as a teeth of lions, a phrase borrowed from Joel 1.6, speaks of the ferociousness and the violence of the army. The breastplates of iron speak of the Arab's armor. The poem Antar makes at least four references to a warrior's breastplate. The Quran says, God has given you coats of mail to defend you in your wars. The locust tails, like unto scorpions, may be understood, may, may be understood referred to either one, the muzzle's ability to shoot backwards and with precision while retreating a full gallop. Two, the fact that victorious Muslims infected the conquered with their pernicious doctrines by forcing them to convert to Islam. <coughs> God's purpose for the plague of locusts. The reason God allowed this plague was to bring his people to repentance. No. I have to go into further into that when I get there. This can be seen in the final two verses of Revelation 9. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders nor of their sorcerers nor their fornication nor of their thefts. Anyone knows anything about church history knows that these were the very sins in which the church was steeped with the false prophet Muhammad was raised up. Just as God used the heathen kings of Assyria and Babylon as a rod of correction to chasten and correct and purify his people in olden times, so he used the heathen Muhammad as the scourge of God for the, for the, for the fallen religion. After a century and a half of war and conquest, Islam has supplanted Christianity of much of the Eastern Empire. Adam Clark points out that part of the church which survived the Islamic wars was not at all corrected by judgments which fell upon the Eastern Church, but continued in senseless adoration of angels, saints, relics, etc., and does so to the present day. Christians of the past believed that Revelation was a prophecy of the rise of Islam and the Muslim invasion of the Christian world. If this view is correct, does this mean that Revelation 9 can have no further fulfillment of events of the present or future? Not at all. The nature of prophecy is such that a prophetic word may find its fulfillment more than one time, in more than one single event. Consider the prophecies of Matthew 24. Some found the fulfillment in the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, and they will also find further fulfillment in events just prior to the second coming. Whether we agree with those who saw Revelation 9 as a reference to Islam or not, one thing is certain. The Islamic armies are rising again and sending out more to vex the world like a plague of locusts. Centuries ago, they abandoned their lust for conquest and world domination in order to pursue literature and the sciences. Now they have abandoned their love for literature and the sciences and returned to their lust for conquest and world domination. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, God says in Hosea 4.6. Most Americans' knowledge of the scriptures is very superficial and shallow or totally non-existent. I just wanted to say Americans, most of the world. Sadly, this is often true even among church people. As a result, people are ripe for deception. One deceptive lie that is currently making great headway among Americans is the notion that Islam is a fine, noble religion. Unfortunately, even our president has used these words to describe Islam. Not the present president, because it's a little bit dated. Where there are some fine, noble Muslim people, the religion of Islam is a counterfeit faith that has its source from the bottomless pit, the abyss of darkness. The Israelis have dealt with the spirit of Islam longer than we have. They might not understand everything about the spiritual nature of Islam, its source and the spirit behind it, but many Israelis understand enough to know that Allah, the God of Islam, is not the same as Yahweh, the God of the Jews and Christians. In a recent article in the, in the Jewish press, Finning writes about his visit to the U.S. Finning happened to be in New York during the week of September 11th. He was in a small grocery store when he heard President Bush announce on the radio that there would be a national day of prayer. Quote, go to the church, to the synagogue, to the mosque, and pray, end of quote. That's what President Bush said. 
Feeling describes his reaction. Did I hear right? I asked the storekeeper. Did he say mosque? She nodded. At this very moment you lost the war. I said to an astonished storekeeper. Philon explains, quote, they slaughter you in the name of Allah and now the president calls on you to pray to him? End of quote. It is not proper to say that Islam is a counterfeit faith that should be renounced, rejected, and abandoned by Muslim people. The spirit of the age is pushing for an all-inclusive, new age view that sees all religions, even Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism as legitimate faiths. Our proclaiming that all non biblical faiths are illegitimate will not make us popular, but we are not in a popularity contest. The scripture speaks of only one faith the faith that once was delivered to the saints. Our proclaiming this one faith, the faith described in the Holy Scriptures, will set us apart from the mainstream, but it's the only hope for our nation. It's the only hope for anyone, period. Now, they were on to something between 150 and 200 years ago, and on the same time, is when the Christian science fiction, I believe, Satan's deception and his minions came on the scene and rapidly changed the direction concerning how to decipher and understand not only the book of Revelation but everything that's tied to it in other books that connects to it. It's a shame, but it was not yet God's time. The time of the Gentiles was not complete. The time when even Daniel was hoping to understand what he was seeing with his own eyes was not ready to be, fulfilly, to be completely fulfilled and understood. But we don't live in that time period any longer. Everything, in my opinion, including future events that we have to decipher and see how it possibly could take place. Can we be slightly offshore? I'm not one of these characters on TV that says, God told me. No, God speaks through his word. And it's our job to dig a little deeper and find out what it is relaying to us as best as we can. That's when the rightly dividing the word of God comes in. And that's what we do here. And that's what we'll continue to do here. Now I just wanted to take this little sidebar this evening. There's a lot of things that we still need to get to. This is an interesting piece. But there's yet more to come concerning these chapters and how it lines up with the seals and the bowls or vials and how all of it's interconnected in some way. Now, if you're interested, I want to hear from you as we continue in our march towards understanding God's prophetic word, which he's already declared, which we have here in the scriptures. I pray that we are guided by him and his Holy Spirit to rightly divide it and not depend on some Christian science fiction nonsense that totally is off the wall. I wanted to say something else, but I can't. So I'll just leave it at that. If you're interested in the future to hear more about this and other topics in the Last Day series, and check out the archives and come back to the live programming. You got it? Play a song. I want to hear from you. <laughs> 